Okay, good evening, everybody. How are you doing? Great. Uh, if anyone wants to kind of get closer so you can see directly up here, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Armando Minjares. I'm the coordinator of student diversity programs at the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Pronouns he, him. Uh, the event tonight, it's going to be live stream on our Facebook and YouTube. Hello to anybody watching online. And thanks all of you who are here in person. We appreciate you making the track in this, um, you know, the weather. We never know what we're gonna get down here. I would like to go ahead and start with a land acknowledgement. Uh, we want to recognize the land of which uh, this conference is taking place. Uh, we are occupied, we're on occupied homelands of the Wichita, Osage, Ka, and Great Sioux Nation peoples. We must be forced to acknowledge and grapple with this reality of colonialism and the history of residential boarding schools and educational institutions, which have been used to destroy traditional gender roles and sexualities of indigenous peoples, as we are talking about gender and sexuality. Tonight's event, Diversity Lecture Series featuring CJ Genovi is also uh, presented in, um, along with the um, Gender and Sexuality in Kansas Conference. Uh, again, we appreciate all of you being here. And at this time, I would like to um, invite Dr. Jenny Pearson uh, to, to say a few words. Thank you again, everyone. And Jenny, you wanna come up here? So I have the honor of introducing our speaker tonight. I am Jenny Pearson, professor of sociology, she, her pronouns, um, and faculty advisor for Shocker Sociology and Spectrum. CJ Janovey is a veteran journalist with deep roots in the Midwest. She grew up in Nebraska, graduated from the University of California at Berkeley, and earned a master's in creative writing from Boston University. She returned to the Midwest to begin her career in journalism in Kansas City. CJ is currently Director of Journalism Content at KCUR, Kansas City's NPR affiliate, where she has also been a digital managing editor and an arts reporter. She was the founding opinion editor at the Kansas Reflector and was editor of The Pitch for over a decade. Her award-winning book, No Place Like Home, Lessons in Activism from LGBT Kansas, tells the stories of LGBTQ activists who fought for respect and justice in our often hostile state many of whom have some connections to Wichita State, I'll add. The book is now a documentary project being directed by Academy Award-winning director, Kevin Wilmot. Please join me in welcoming CJ Janovey. Hi, everyone. Hi. Shockers. Uh, thank you. Dr. Pearson, Armando, everyone for inviting me. It's um, a huge honor to, to and uh, hi everyone at home, um, a huge honor to, um, to be invited to give a talk like this for this audience and this occasion. And um, yeah, just, just thank you. And um, I want to also um, acknowledge I've had a chance to chat with quite a few of you before the event and all the people who are remaining working tables tonight. Mm -hmm. And um, there's just like really amazing, important work going done, being done by the folks who are um, set up around the room. And if you haven't had a chance to meet each other and check each other out, you should totally do that. You probably all know each other, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay. So, um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to, uh, so yeah, I wrote a book. It's called No Place Like Home Lessons in Activism from LGBT Kansas, but I, I've sort of been, you know, it's been four years since it came out and I've, um, I've talked about this book quite a bit over the last few years and I, I've been thinking some new things recently and so I'm gonna, uh, that's why I changed the title to let my own lessons really from decades of reporting on LGBTQ Kansas. So I'm I'm a journalist. I'm not a scholar. So tonight you're not gonna you're not gonna get any theory. You're not gonna get any analysis. 
you're not going to get, um, you know, much really deep thinking. I'm probably going to tell you a lot. I'm going to tell you almost, I, I think you, you all will know everything that I'm going to tell you if you read the news or even you know, listen to the news if you're a public radio listener. Um, you know, so um, there are people in this room who, who are more authoritative than I am on many of the things that I'm going to talk about. So it's sometimes said that journalism is the first rough, rough draft of history. And um, I'm, I'm finding that to be true. One of the things that I, you know, so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll say, and uh, someone earlier was saying that they felt vulnerable saying some stuff. So I, I will feel vulnerable by saying that I'm going to turn 60 this year. And uh, that makes me um, old enough to have lived some, some really striking recent history. And um, I will say time goes really fast. And especially this history that I'm gonna talk about has gone remarkably fast uh, considering what it's been about. So, um, you know, I'm, all, I'm always asking other people to tell their stories. That's what I do for a living. That's, um, you know, but I, I just, I've, you know, because I've been thinking about things a little bit differently um, and really because we could all get nuked any day now. And um, that feels very much like part of my history, the 1980s, which I remember in real time. And um, I've decided, you know, that I'm just, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell a little bit of my story uh, uh, tonight. Um, and, and, and hopefully it'll make sense how it fits into the larger story. So uh, just, just to uh, make some qualifications on that, I'm white, I'm cisgender, I come from an upper middle class Midwestern family. Um, my story is a tiny, tiny bit of the story. And it's a, um, I'm gonna go over it really fast. I'm gonna leave out a lot of stuff. And so one of my big messages for all of you is tell your own stories. There are so many more books that need to be written about, about you know, Kansas, about our stories. And so um, that's one of your jobs now. Okay, so, um, okay, so um, just, to, just to sort of place this story, I'm originally from Lincoln, Nebraska. My grandparents were, lived in Oklahoma City and El Reno, Oklahoma. So the early, from my earliest memories, the funnest times in my life going to see my grandparents involved this eight hour drive, most of it through Kansas. And my parents insisted on taking this two lane Highway 15 through Abilene Clay Center, at Clay Center Abilene, um, down to Wichita before they finally got on the interstate and we could get to my grandparents more quickly. So twice a year, summer vacation, Christmas vacation, it, you know, it was through Kansas. And so in those days, Kansas was always a place to get through. If I was lucky, we would sleep for it all, but, um, but it, it, it gave me um, a connection to Kansas that I only really began to understand understand later. Like a lot of kids, uh, when I, I, I left home as soon as I possibly could. A lot of gay kids from the Midwest, I left as soon as I could. So I went uh, out to um, San Francisco Bay Area for undergraduate school and I worked for a while for a national gay rights organization. And um, during those times, it was the 80s, it was um, AIDS had just arrived. And um, also in 1986, um, the United States Supreme Court ruled that a man in Georgia could be arrested for having consensual sex in his bedroom with another man. So this was a crime. The Supreme Court said this was a crime. And so this was infuriating. And uh, we, we were fighting for our lives. We were fighting for our, you know, basic rights. And so we went to a march on Washington. And I was there for that um, 1987 march on Washington. You can see my glorious mullet. <laughs> Um, I'm very proud to have uh, 
sported in those days. This was the first um, uh, uh, first um, time that the AIDS Memorial quilt, quilt was on the National Mall. I'm carrying that. I'm carrying a, a, a pole that has a big sign with the name of my um, my the organization that I work for, the National Gay Rights Advocates. Uh, there, so. Um, this was a very, you know, energetic, vibrant time. The stakes were very high. Um, and we actually made progress during those years. We fought for our lives. And people, a lot of people, you know, understood that, you know, they didn't want their children dying of AIDS and the government wasn't helping. And um, we, I think we opened a lot of, of hearts and minds during that time. Um, we get to the end of the 80s and uh, early 90s, and we're all excited because Bill Clinton runs for office, and he uh, promises that among the he courts the gay community. And I'm I'm saying gay because it was pretty much gays and lesbians and L, L I don't remember the acronyms back then, but it was gays gays and lesbians basically. So um, Clinton says he's going to lift the ban on gays in the military, and um, courts the gay vote and he gets elected and he makes this promise. And uh, this was huge. This was really, really big. Um, and everybody was excited. Um, this was 92. When I was looking for, um, when I was looking for historical, I don't know, pictures to show you guys tonight, I came across this on YouTube and I'm gonna, I'm gonna play it for you. You guys are from Kansas. You know Melissa Etheridge, right? Some very young ones in the front <laughs> row. You know she's gay, right? Okay, in 1983, we did not know she was gay. Okay, so there was so much excitement about Bill Clinton's election. She's in Washington, D.C. for uh, one, of the, one of the many, many uh, uh, parties, festivities that's, uh, that are uh, happening around the Clinton inauguration. And she's at this, this, uh, this dance, this ball, the triangle ball. I want to, so I'm gonna play this for you in a second if it'll work. First though, can, can you guys all see this person behind her? Okay, everyone know Katie Lang? Okay, so here's, here's Katie Lang had come out like a few months before this, but Melissa Etheridge, she was singing love songs and there was no, there were no men in her love songs. There were a lot of yous, but nobody really, nobody, I mean, we all knew she was gay, but she, no, you know, the big world did not know she was gay. So here she is. Um. I'm gonna replay it, okay, here we go. Now, please welcome Melissa Etheridge. Watch what Katie Lang does. She's proud to say she's been a lesbian all her life. That moment she came out. And I, I, I mean, I, I just like want to emphasize, we did not have pop culture heroes that were out. We didn't have big celebrities that were out. So when she did this, uh, it was huge. My slides are stuck. Okay, so 
that year, later that year, she comes out with this album, Yes I Am, and um, this album becomes known as her breakthrough album, okay? It's, it spends 138 weeks on Billboard's top 200 charts. It has two, two uh, peaks at number 15, has two hit singles. So this is like, not only did coming out like not hurt her career, but it actually, you know, helps. Uh, a few years later, Ellen comes out. This did hurt Ellen's career for a little while, but she came back strong and I'm not gonna go much into Ellen, but I'm going to just note here in the 90s how, uh, how pop culture changed for us, okay? It's about this time, I get, I get to Kansas City in 1991. Fred Phelps and the Westboro Baptist Church are beginning to export their act from Topeka where they've been protesting with their, with their uh, offensive signs uh, for a few years. And they start going, they start going to Kansas City. They start taking that national. And I'm, I'm work, by then I'm employed as a journalist. I'm working for a paper called the New Times uh, uh, at that time. And so um, I'm out of grad school. I'm settled in Kansas City and I'm, I'm trying to you know, make a career. So part of what we end up covering, I just, I want to go, I want to just show a couple more history slides here for you. And um, because pretty quickly, gay marriage becomes an issue politically. And so um, you'll note, you know, so first, first people apply for a marriage license in 1972, and then really nothing, not very much happens um, until the mid nineties. Uh, and Hawaii, you know, denies a marriage license for a same-sex couple, and then this sort this 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 issue begins to escalate. And you'll see another Clinton disappointment there in 1996. He signs the Defense of Marriage Act, which uh, he's so embarrassed that he signs it in the middle of the night. So there's no there's no uh, media there to watch it. There's no ceremony. Um, you know, by then he's also I don't know if it's by then, but the, the other big disappointment with Clinton is, that, you know, he did not lift the ban on gays in the military. He gave us don't ask, don't tell, which was another uh, disappointment. Uh, the gay marriage time, you know, the, the battle escalates here. And I think a lot of us at the time would say marriage was not that important to a lot of us. Um, you know, a lot of us just didn't want to get killed, beaten up, fired, kicked out of our apartments, kicked out of our families. You know, I don't know, marriage, 50% of heterosexual marriages end in divorce. Why would we want, you know, to participate in an institution that fails half the time? Well, that was my thinking. I'm married now, happily married, but um, uh, it was, it was this, a lot of us felt like it was this issue that was being really forced on us. And this culminates in November, 2004, where when 11 states pass constitutional amendments saying that marriage is only one man and one woman, same uh, election that George W. Bush gets reelected. And there was this narrative that really quickly developed partly because of this gay marriage, this anti-gay marriage push in all these states and the the narrative that that uh, the media all began reporting very quickly was that values voters had helped to reelect George Bush, voters who were concerned about moral values and the and the and the gay marriage issue had driven these folks to the polls and they had swept George Bush to victory. We know that may may not be true in retrospect. We have we have. Uh, Later the next year, the uh, director of polling at ABC um, pointing out that this that there was just a really um, vague exit poll question that that voters answered in a way that didn't really lend itself to solid data. And so, but I I, I think that that the scholarship here. Uh, probably is not the prevailing narrative. I think the prevailing merit narrative over time is that the values voters helped, helped get George Bush elected. So um, this is a little bit of uh, media criticism for you here um, and by members of the media critiquing their own here. 
Um, meanwhile, in Kansas, <laughs> Uh, Kansas tried, the Kansas legislature tried in 2004 to place an amendment on the ballot banning same-sex marriage. It did not work. It uh, worked the next year in 2005, and here's the uh, small handful of people who tried to stop that from happening, uh, looking at the very depressing election results on uh, that night, April 2005, when 70% of the voters of Kansas say, uh, marriage should be only one man and one, one woman. So who was alive and remembers that? Okay. I, I, uh, you guys are laughing. Were you all alive in 2004? Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. So, yeah. So like you, what it feels like to go, you know, to go to your, you know, nearest polling place, the basement of the nearby school or community center or wherever and realize that 70% of the people who voted that day, your friends, your neighbors, your coworkers, your, your family members are against you. That hurts, okay? Um, wow, look what happens a decade later, <laughs> okay? United States, these gay marriage, these legal cases escalate, they go all the way to the Supreme Court which says gay marriage is legal by then 55% of Americans are perfectly fine with it. So what happened during that decade? What happened? <laughs> I don't think she was there yet. Um, I, I, don't th I don't think yet. My, the book that I wrote is partly about that and I, I will play you guys a, a short, the trailer for, um, for this documentary version of the book, uh, which is, uh, Still not, the film is still not done, but here's a short trailer for it. Like that stand of trees far back? Yes, that's still my farm. There are those who believe that LGBTQ history, activism, and progress happens only on the coast. Most Americans think Kansas is a place LGBTQ people leave. No place like home is the story of why they stay. One of the people said, I need to go somewhere else where I can really be gay. But that's not the only thing that people are thinking about when they're making choices to live somewhere. No place like home is a story of people who chose to fight. It is a story of unexpected activism, of people who decided to make Kansas a better place. This is my land, this is my county. I'm not going to let bigotry run me off of the place that I love. We're in Trigo County. We're on the farm of Sandra Stenzel, whose grandparents homesteaded here in 1915. Three generations of Stenzels have lived here, and we love it. She's the, the, just the classic Kansas farm girl. It was just really a great sense of community. Sandra left Kansas for a career in Austin. But family obligations and her love of her Trigo County farm brought her back, albeit a changed woman. I thought I had a choice. I thought I could choose not to be gay. I, it wasn't until much later in my life that I realized I had a choice between being happy or being so freaking miserable I wanted to die. Sandra had a great job in economic development. She was a leader in her community, active in politics. And then, almost overnight, it all came crashing down. All of this started in Kansas in 2004, 2005, when nationally gay marriage became an issue. All these people from Lawrence and Kansas City and Wichita said, yeah, 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 we'll testify. And I'm thinking, I got to go down there and testify too. They need to know that there are gay people in Western Kansas, that this is an entire statewide issue from border to border. For a lot of people that meant going public with their lives. And the last thing I said was, my job is being director of economic development in Trigo County. And that's a hard job. Don't pass this legislation and make my job any harder than it already is. I woke up the next morning and I turned on my computer and my email inbox was full. And I'm like, what the hell? 
And so I started clicking and it was like this person saying, hey, I saw you on the front page of the Hayes Daily. Hey, I saw you on the front page of the Wichita Eagle. Oh my God, did everybody notice? And that's when things started burning with a hot flame. You didn't just lose your job, you lost what you felt at the time, despite all of this public support you had. It felt as if you'd lost your reputation. So, so what happened? They were looking for any reason to fire me. And they went through every email I ever sent, every letter I ever wrote. They confiscated my computer. They went through everything. The county attorney was convinced I had gay porn on my office computer. I didn't get fired for being gay. I got fired for talking about being gay. Almost everyone I talked to in the book was responding to a threat of some sort, and they saw an injustice happening, and they, they thought, you know, someone needs to stand up and fight this injustice. No place like home takes you on a tour of a deep red state, to Dodge City, Salina, and Hutchinson, to meet people who found themselves in a decade-long battle for LGBTQ rights because they loved Kansas. You can just tell how much they love their town and their, their community and their neighbors. And in the case of Sandra, who lives outside of town, you can tell how much she loves this beautiful place. And it's a story and struggle that is far from over. We have to do what we can, where we are with what we've got. And where I am is in the middle of Western Kansas, in the reddest part of the state, where people, it's easier to be gay than it is to be Democrat. And just start where you are and do something. Every year there's at least one rally of LGBT folks at the state capitol in Topeka. And in recent years, the folks who go to those rallies have been overwhelmingly young people. And there was also this emergence of transgender folks in public life. In Kansas, that was happening well before it was happening around the rest of the country. I think you'll see LGBT people helping other folks learn how to be activists, learn how to be allies, learn how to sort of conquer your fear and go out in public and let your voice be known, even though it can be scary at times. You have a lot of LGBT people who've risked their lives to help make the world a better place for everyone. We need to name our adversaries and we need to name the bigotry and we need, we need to call it out when we see it and not be afraid of it because if you can take that step of standing there and naming it, if you look behind you, there will be thousands of people standing behind you. Coming soon. Coming soon was like four years ago, so really soon now. Um, so just like real quick, just to recap, one of the one of the tactics that people used was to uh, go to City Hall and ask to pass a non-discrimination ordinance, uh, which Wichita finally did uh, this past summer. Congratulations! It's been since 1978, the first time you tried it. Um, and, you know, you guys know when you have these hearings at City Hall, you have these debates, you have this newspaper coverage, uh, the conversation is going on in your community, you educate a lot of people. And so Kansas did that in lots of places over the last decade. And um, I suggest in my book that that's one of the reasons that public opinion began to change. Um, but the, uh, who knows new or knew Stephanie Mott? Okay, a few of you. Um, Stephanie was one of the people I was talking about when I said you'll see this emergence of trans leaders in Kansas. So she died in 2019, suddenly, unexpectedly. Um, before that, though, she had uh, be begun living authentically and um, she had an incredible life story. Those of you who heard it know that's a story of, of uh, you know, uh, 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 um, well, she had, she, you know, she struggled. She always knew that she, that she was, uh, uh, n n that she was not uh, the, 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 the gender on her birth certificate. And um, she had uh, 
an addiction problem. She uh, struggled. She found herself homeless uh, at the Topeka Rescue Mission. Uh, and then she went to church and she literally became born again. And she traveled the state of Kansas uh, telling this story. And it was an incredibly powerful story. And she gave hundreds of presentations around the state. Um, you'll see, you know, if you can see her bumper sticker, she's transgender and Christian. Fourth of July weekend in 2011, she drives all around the state. She stops people at random in public places and talks to them. And then she writes about it. And she calls this the transgender tour of Kansas. And it becomes the foundation for much of her work. Um, and again, that was 2011. It's not really until, you know, four years later, and the, Caitlyn Jenner comes out on the cover of Vanity Fair that the rest of the country really sort of has a, a national pop culture conversation about, about trans identity. And so, uh, you know, Kansas was a leader here. And um, then the years that followed, there were more victories, okay? So, uh, a group of plaintiffs won their lawsuit to uh, be able to change their markers on birth certificates in Kansas. Uh, in November of 2018, folks in Johnson County elected Sharice Davids. They also sent two openly gay folks to the um, Kansas House of Representatives. Um, this is progress, you guys. This is exciting. November 2020, Wichita sends Stephanie Byers to uh, Topeka to serve in the Kansas House of Representatives. So things are going great, right? Progress. <laughs> so this is these are just a few of the headlines from last year's legislative session, uh, where the uh, the uh, bill to prohibit legal care for trans kids did not get anywhere, but the uh, uh, tr trans women's sp uh, sports ban did pass. Governor Kelly vetoed it. The legislature was not able to override it, but uh, this year it's back. My slides are already out of date. Uh, I made them like three days ago and action has been happening in the legislature this week. And this is now grown to a national issue. And this is where this historical perspective comes in because this, this is just the gay marriage national hysteria all over again. That's all it is. And it's almost the exact same pattern that we're seeing, okay? And um, I will also say that, uh, you know, this is, this is a backlash to progress, but it's, but, uh, and it's happening on another front that will uh, be familiar here as well. So we have these two parallel, hot, hot, supposedly controversial issues happening nationally right now. And um, they're both very, very familiar. Actually, when I, again, when I was researching here, I went to look at uh, critical race theory attacks and 41 states have now introduced legislation uh, to, to regulate uh, what's being taught in schools. And so I recognize this. I recognize this dynamic. I recognize this discussion. And um, it's, it's not about these issues. Trans girls are not hurting women's sports. And I'm pretty sure everybody knows that. And um, all this is is about power and politics. So uh, I was writing about this uh, last summer and I called uh, Dr. Saucier, Saucier, I'm not, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce his last name at Case at uh, K State, and he talked to me about political rhetoric, and he explained that this is just a classic tactic. If you can make people scared, if you can make them anxious, and then you can promise them that you will protect them, that makes a really strong political message, and. Um, one reason this works, you guys, is because most people don't vote, okay? Most people might vote for president, they might vote for senator, but most people don't vote for their city council people, their school board reps, their state reps, 
I saw some number that said 14% of Wichita voters voted in the last mayoral election. Don't quote me, but I, 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 that's, a, that's a typical number for a, a municipal election. And so politicians who are trying to scare people, they don't have to convince very many people for this tactic to work, okay? So when I was, um, when I was, when I've been talking about the book and the lessons in activism that I learned writing the book, um, I would, I have, I've been over the last four years telling people that, you know, all the lessons, you know, I, I interviewed 56 people and everybody's story, you might take a different lesson, but themes emerged. And, you know, in, and so one of those themes was prepare to lose, <laughs> especially if you're fighting political battles. You have to lose a bunch of times before you, you know, educate enough people or gather enough data about voters or or whatever. If you, you know, prepare to lose. But a lot eventually a lot of those losses will finally lead to a win. And you, I, I could see that in my book. Another lesson was to be gentle with your allies you, you, in any in any political organization. There's all sorts of infighting, <laughs> fight about tactics and strategies and language. And especially now with social media, you know, language is changing and it's easy to say the wrong thing. And, and you know, people can get offended much more quickly. And, and my, uh, the lesson that, that the activists talked about was just, you know, uh, how destructive it is when you're fighting amongst yourselves instead of fighting the the greater cause. And then the third lesson uh, was just to do something. In, in my book, there's moments, you know, there's people who can be leading these rallies at the state house steps. There's people who can go on TV and be interviewed. Um, and then there's people who, who just write anonymous checks or there's people who bake lemon bars and uh, you know, all those things matter. Um, I'm not, I, I've, I've put up some different lessons <laughs> up here for this talk because I've, um, because these lessons apply not just to people in my profession, journalism, but I think we're, we're in a, an even more dangerous um, dark time than we were when my book came out four years ago. I remember being at my book launch party at the Lawrence Public Library in January of 2018 and where there was conversation afterwards and someone, I don't even know, what the question was, but I, I remember saying that I was afraid for democracy. That was four years ago and I'm 400 times more afraid now. So um, we have to, I mean, the, the history that I have lived is, a, is, you know, it's only a few decades and I've seen these patterns and um, we have to, we have to learn from history and not let the same things keep happening over and over and over again. Um, we have to question the political rhetoric that's out there. We, we can't let elected officials who supposedly represent us uh, say things that aren't true. We just can't. And um, we have to hold... Uh, we have to know who our lawmakers are and we have to hold them accountable. Okay. So just, these are, these are some new lessons for myself as much as for anyone who wants to hear them. And, um, that's all I've got for you guys. So, um, thank you for listening and we can, we can chat, we can, uh, go home to warm, warm, uh, houses or whatever, but thank you for having me. Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Oh, this. Hello, everyone. We have some time to uh, do some, uh, ask some questions uh, for from CJ. Also, hello. No. Also, I would like to let you know that we do have a reception right afterwards. So there's plenty of food to, for everyone to eat and hang out and get to know her. So stick around if you can. But right now, we can take questions from you. Anybody? Yes. 
we, the question is, when is the documentary coming out? I, I, I'm, I don't know. It's very close to being done, um, but I've learned uh, movies take even longer to, to finish than books. And um, Kevin Wilmot is a genius and I'm not gonna mess with his process. So just, I'm being patient. Who was the most, who was the most interesting person that you Who was the most interesting person I interviewed when I was researching for my book to answer that question would be as would be like if you asked me my favorite child. And um, I think that um, I'm not going to answer that. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to answer that question. Um, you know, some people's stories were more dramatic than others. Sandra Stenzel, who, who was in the trailer, uh, her story is very, very dramatic. Um, you know, there were not, uh, there were a, a lot of other people who didn't face the same kind of consequences um, publicly that she did. Um, but there were certainly, what I, what I loved about reporting the book was just how generous people were with their stories. And, um, you know, my job, my job, what I do is just, I, I ask people, I say, you know, so, tell me about yourself. And people did. And I would ask really personal questions. I was just doing this uh, with Donna. Is Donna. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I'm sorry, but you were, Donna has an amazing story. And I think if you ask anyone just to talk about themselves, you find those stories if if they're willing to to share and be a little bit vulnerable and people were and i think that's another theme that emerged was that people a lot of these stories were really really painful it was it was very painful for several of these people to recount this time it was a very unhappy time people people were hurt in in very concrete ways and they all said to me I'm going to tell you this in hopes that it'll be easier for future generations. People need to know this so that it doesn't happen again. And, and that's why I'm telling you this. And that was just so, um, that felt like such a responsibility and it was so motivating. And I, I just really, um, I'm just super grateful to everyone who, who shared those stories. More questions? Anybody else back there? Yeah. So it looks like a lot of the people in Kansas, you know, they have these great stories and they stay here to make this better in Kansas. Is that like the obviously I get your vote to find out that's true, but um, <laughs> but how do you like for me, I want to get out of here so fast, like there well as a journalist you know i can only interview the people who are here in front of me so um which is not technically true i did make phone calls to people in other places and some of the some of the people in the book either had moved or moved after the book came out and so um it, it's an individual choice you know i mean no, nobody's going to nobody's going to begrudge anyone who wants to get the hell out of kansas at this point but what the story that's not told about kansas is all the reasons people do want to stay i mean the stereotype is you want to leave a place like kansas and so I knew that that was one of the things that would make my book so interesting and surprising to people is that, you know, not only are there a lot of LGBTQ people in Kansas, and but a lot of them are happy here. Some people don't have the means to leave. Some people don't have the, um, you know, just the life circumstances. And so it, it's not, there's not one answer to this question. There's individual, thousands of individual answers. But, but for those who do stay for whatever reason and, and have that 
that courage, that motivation to actually try and make a difference. Um, I think what they find is, you know, there's sort of two sides of this, that a little bit of work can make a really big difference in a place like Kansas, but also there aren't very many people doing it. And so there's like this, you know, tiny little group of activists and they, they get burned out and they don't get the reinforcements and then the work, the work gets lost. And so I think it's a, it's a, it's a, there, that's always that's those two dynamics are always happening at the same time. Any other questions? Anyone? Great. Well, I'd just like to um, first of all thank you, CJ, thank for you. joining thank us this guys. evening, and for everyone coming out tonight. I want to shout out some of the organizations that join us tonight. We have Positive Directions, a great partner for the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. Uh, WASAC is also here with us, Equality Kansas. Let's see, MCARE is here. Spectrum, our LGBTQ student organization, at Wichita State. We have Glesson, of course, the Department of Sociology, who every year puts this conference together. And uh, Urch, there in the back. Uh, also, we would like to thank uh, Fidelity Bank, our presenting sponsor for uh, this um, Diversity Lecture Series tonight. Uh, again, I want to encourage all of you to stick around a little longer. If you just go around to the next room, uh, there's an opportunity for you to have some one-on-one -on -one time with CJ. Uh, we also have a lot of delicious snacks. I'm always gonna alert you with food. If it's something I learn about college students and everyone else like myself, bring food and they'll stick around a little longer. So please uh, do stick around. Um, uh, quick logistical note, if you are looking for the bathrooms, they're towards the front end. There's a front desk. You're gonna have to go around like you're going to the the front desk and you'll find them, they're right there. Um, again, thanks all of you. Uh, we'll see you here in a couple of minutes next door. And Jenny, any final thoughts? Oh, good, great. Well, again, thanks everyone for coming out. Thank you again, CJ. And yeah. Now we can get the party started, yeah? Okay, thank you. I was actually in the trailer for the. Um, you are? Yeah, I didn't no, realize. Marching down the street. It was on during the Manhattan Prize.